at some point. Ah, <laughs> uh, yep. No green light yet. Okay, so it could actually be recording. Yeah. Yeah, everybody had coffee. <laughs> Not much of a morning person, so I've had a bit myself. Yeah, I'm in Raleigh. Uh, how far away is is everybody? What's what's the furthest? Any any guesses? New Hampshire. Okay. Any further than New Hampshire? <laughs> Behind you on the other side. I think I'll give it another minute and then we'll go ahead and get started and if the recording catches up, it catches up. All right, I'll just go ahead and get started. And yeah, maybe the recording is happening, maybe not. We'll find out later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's still still green light, so don't know what's up that. All right, uh, I'll just try to talk a little bit louder. 
Uh, so we're going to go through uh, who, I, who I am, uh, why you should use diagrams, what diagrams can do for you, uh, what some of the tools that exist, and then finally some tips on how to start using diagrams in your processes. First, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the tech lead for console.ray.com subscription functionality. I'm currently uh, working a lot with OpenShift, Java, OpenAPI, and Kafka. Uh, if you want to know any more about that, uh, feel free to ask me some questions. Uh, also, I'm a dog person, so you'll see a few slides where you know I've got to share some cute dog pictures. This is my dog, Azure. Uh, when my wife named her that, I told her, okay, well, every pet we have from now on, we have to name after a cloud provider. <laughs> that didn't float so well, um, but we'll see. All right, uh, so first, um, why you should use diagrams. Uh, this is maybe obvious, but communication is difficult. Uh, software is complex. Kubernetes, uh, just as an example, I, I don't know how many folks got to catch any of Jason Plum's uh, Kubernetes intro, but there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Um, just to give you an idea of if you were to jump into the Kubernetes code, uh, what you'd find there are 27 uh, Golang packages, 23,000 files in the repo uh, as of yesterday when I checked anyways. And that's without even getting into how many you know, Golang modules are present or even starting to talk through you know, how the code is organized. There's just a lot there. Uh, and then you know, Linux, over 1,900 modules and you know, 70 some thousand odd files. Uh, those are modules that are shipped with Fedora at least. Uh, and the, the file count was a fresh GitHub clone uh, from a couple of days ago. So um, question you should ask yourself is, you know, given your code uh, or given your project or infrastructure, any of those things that you're trying to communicate to someone, uh, how do you do it? Is it, is it something where you just kind of throw them off the deep end, you know, toss them off the metaphorical cliff and hope they land in the water? Or is it something that you're, you know, being a little bit nicer about? Uh, I hope you know, that, that you don't generally just kind of throw people in and hope they, they uh, swim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, for, for me, I'd say diagrams are a large uh, part of how I have come to communicate whenever I'm talking with all kinds of people. Um, so why diagrams? Uh, diagrams visually convey information. Uh, this is... XKCD with a, a number of, of examples that, that you may have seen before. I'll zoom in just a little bit, actually. So all disciplines um, use diagrams and charts. So, you know, you've got, uh, whether you're talking about, like, earth science or linguistics or, um, you know, light analysis, all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't think you'll find a discipline that doesn't use diagrams. Um, so, again, you know, from that, the the gist is it's just another way to communicate, and it's it's one that's very information rich. Um, so I'm just going to jump directly into what some tools are uh, for doing that. So first, let's talk about the most popular diagramming tool you probably already have installed. Whiteboards and markers, um, or paper, pen, and pencil. Um, so, you know, this is a very freeform diagramming tool. Uh, this plus a smartphone, and, you know, that's the bare minimum you really need to diagram. Uh, this analogy also, you know, extends to notebooks or drawing tablets, any of that. Um, so, so I'd say, you know, if nothing else, you almost always have a uh, whiteboard and marker or pen and paper available. So um, that's a nice reminder to just kind of stay, you know, down to earth with it. Uh, one downside to doing whiteboards and markers or pen and paper, you know, is they're not good for remote uh, collaboration. Uh, another downside is that uh, they're not, uh, not easy to keep up to date. You know, once you've taken a picture of a diagram, you want to go back in and edit it, well, uh, good luck.
Okay, okay. For for anyone, uh, it, I don't know if the recording is happening, but if it is, uh, for for anyone, awesome, awesome. Okay. So, uh, gentleman in the audience pointed out that Xerox years ago had made uh, whiteboards that could talk to each other, and so you could actually have collaboration on on some whiteboards. All right. Um, so, first, non uh, real world tool that I want to talk about is diagrams.net. Uh, first off, I have a joke up here. Um, I'm, I, I just want to see if anybody can tell me what this is. Yes, sir. Hybrid cloud. Yes, this is a hybrid cloud. <laughs> I've had <a> <laughs> Yeah, I had a plant just in case no one got it. <laughs> All right. Um, so, things I like about uh, diagrams.net. You may have seen this as draw.io, um, but they, they rebranded uh, a few years back. Uh, it's a free form. It's a web app. There's a lot of uh, shapes built in. It reminds me of uh, Inkscape, if you've ever tried Inkscape, uh, but it's got a lot of built-in shapes. So, so I think of it as a free form drawing tool that just happens to have a lot of um, shapes built in for diagramming. It's also, go ahead. Nice. I do, yeah. And uh, tools like Dia and Yed, I, I, I feel like just haven't aged super well. Yeah. Um, so, so just for the the recording, um, someone pointed out there is a plugin for VS Code or or uh, VS Codium to do uh, diagrams not net within that IDE. Uh, as I mentioned, you know there are a lot of nice shapes. I, I threw together just a few um, shapes that are available on diagrams.net, but they have a really expansive library. I recommend checking it out, just seeing um, what and all is there at some point. Uh, another one uh, that I've kind of discovered and started looking at recently um, is Excaladraw. So Excaladraw uh, is nice for the sketches uh, or I should say the diagrams that Excaladraw produces have a sort of sketch look to them, um, which you know sort of conveys. It feels much more humid than than you get with you know the the sort of bog standard shapes that you get in a lot of diagramming tools, um, and they also have a lot of nice uh, shapes uh, available, um, and you know there's just a little sampling of of what they have. So these are great, but they're open-ended. Uh, you know, you can kind of get lost in the in the chaos. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is that instead that you create diagrams in a more constrained way. Um, and some of the recommendations that I'm going to give are you can apply some of this even to your sort of you know plain whiteboarding. So first, I'm going to talk about some tools. Uh, the first is uh, GraphViz. I'm sure lots of people have seen GraphViz, whether they have, have ever used it or not. You've probably seen diagrams created from GraphViz. So GraphViz is a uh, general purpose uh, graph layout engine. And uh, it, it's mainly used for creating uh, graphs and digraphs. Uh, here's a, a quick example of what the syntax for that looks like. Um, there are a couple of uh, sites that have sprung up that will allow you to sort of interactively edit uh, GraphViz diagrams. Yes, yes, and that that's sort of key here, and I'll I'll get it. I'll come back to that in a moment. So so for the recording or stream, uh, someone pointed out that like the big thing with GraphViz is, is that you've got code generating the diagram rather than sort of, you know, freeform drawing. Uh, another tool uh, that I'd like to, to recommend is uh, PlantUML. So PlantUML, despite its name, does a lot more than uh, UML. Uh, to be honest, I'm not actually uh, personally a very big fan of UML itself. Um, 
except for sequence diagrams. I think sequence diagrams are, are relatively straightforward and easy to understand, but I think a lot of UML otherwise uh, is, is a little dense, a little hard to, hard to take folks who haven't seen UML or haven't worked with UML and sort of you know, get them up to speed on what all annotation means. Um, but some of the other things that Plant UML does, it'll do uh, C4 diagrams and YAML and uh, JSON. I'll, I'll show why I like that in a moment. So uh, first, uh, sequence diagrams with Plant UML. Um, so I did not show the code for this because it's a little bit verbose. But again, this is another tool that you uh, create code for and then uh, get the get Plant UML to generate the diagrams for you. Um, this is one for an API gateway uh, that is part of cloud.reddit.com. And this is a, a much better way to, to talk through, or this has been an invaluable tool for talking through how uh, requests are serviced uh, by part of the, the cloud.reddit.com uh, ecosystem. And you can kind of see, you know, you've got actors or systems um, laid out sort of left or right. And then from top to bottom is, is the flow of data. Um, so here you see that, you know, service account with a uh, TLS client cert makes a call to a gateway. That gateway verifies client cert. Uh, that gateway then forwards a request to Nginx. Um, and there's also policy service involved. And, and this is just a really nice way of conveying a lot really, really quickly. All right, uh, I mentioned C4. So C4 stands for context, container, component, and code. Uh, and I'll kind of go through what each of those means in a moment. Um, C4 uh, is the sort of modeling language that I've come to prefer. Um, it's, it's sort of my favorite modeling language at this point. So a context diagram is to show systems in context of the, the entire you know, solution. So each of these boxes represents a system doesn't talk about how that system is, is sort of put together. Um, this is one for uh, application I work on, or set of, app set of services, rather, um, and how they sort of all interconnect. So you can see which systems talk to which other systems. Uh, just sort of a high level, uh, how the overall solution is put together. That's what the, the system, or that's what the context di diagrams are good for. Uh, the only other thing you generally put in a um, in a context diagram is the personas that are using those systems. So it's the personas using the systems and then the systems and sort of what functions um, those are, are using when they integrate. With C4, um, something that, is, that I find really interesting is that they sort of, the idea is to take and do sort of uh, each layer so con uh, the context diagram is the, the highest level of detail. Well, I should say lowest level of detail, the, the highest sort of logical level. And then the idea is for any one of these systems, you would then create another diagram to talk about how that system's put together. So uh, just to explain how these are related, I'm going to zoom in here. So. Subscription watch UI, so, so that's a system uh, that, that uses subscription watch API. And you can see it's the, the user that's using those. So, so nothing really surprising there. It's just a, an application with a, a back end and a front end. Nothing too surprising. Uh, container diagram, next level down, uh, again for the subscription watch API and UI. Uh, this sort of explains how those are connected together, and what other um, what other pieces they interact with. So, for example, uh, the back end talks to a database. This is where those details kind of go. 
and the back end also consults a RBAC service. So in this level, it's, it's appropriate to see external systems and then what they call containers. And container is sort of overloaded. This is not container as in uh, Docker container. This is container as in a container of an application or a service. So uh, in this case, we have a front end that's written in JavaScript and React that's sort of packaged together in one artifact. So, so I often, often think of container as more of an artifact. Um, it just so happens uh, the back end we do package into a container image. So uh, easy to get wound up over that. But um, again, I, I think of these as the artifacts that, that kind of comprise an application. Component diagrams um, are another level deeper. Uh, this is not from, from my application. This is actually from the samples that are available online for C4. Um, but this is where you would you kind of start to break things down into how is the code actually logically put together. So you take a uh, container and start to decompose it into the actual controllers or or other sort of architectural patterns. Uh, you you know you would still show potentially in the, here um, databases or other external services that you're using. Um, in practice, I'll say that, that this is not a level of detail that's been necessary a lot of times. A lot of times I've found it sufficient to discuss an application sort of at this level of a, of a container. But uh, it, it, it is something that's available. And you, you can kind of imagine, again, how um, that's just another level of detail. The fourth level is code. Uh, quick, quick thing about code is that uh, code would be like showing all the classes and their relations to each other. This is something I don't actually recommend. And uh, plant UML C4, for example, doesn't even have um, doesn't even have the building blocks for that. They they actually encourage you not to do that. Um, if you need to, to kind of show that thing, that's a th that's a function that I'd recommend just letting your IDE do. Uh, I also mentioned that plant UML can, can uh, visualize YAML. Uh, I found this kind of handy, especially for people who are a little bit less uh, familiar with YAML if you've never seen YAML before. Same goes for JSON. Uh, if you ever want to show someone visually uh, how the objects in a, in a YAML document or JSON object uh, play out, this is a very good uh, way to do it. So you can kind of see there how, um, whoop, apologies, let me go back. You can kind of see here how it uses these, these boxes and then arrows to kind of show how their sub-objects and how those are related. Uh, and that, again, that can just be really useful if you're talking to someone who, again, hasn't seen YAML, hasn't seen JSON, or is just generally a little uncomfortable with those. Yeah, comment from the audience was uh, that, yeah, this would be a really useful tool if you're looking at like a new API and you're trying to understand what the responses look like. Uh, this is a really good tool for kind of understanding and uh, sort of reverse engineering what the structures, how those are put together. Uh, and just a a quick note as to what this is, uh, in case anyone's curious. This is the YAML for a uh, Kubernetes deployment object. Uh, and they, they can get a lot more complicated than this. But you can, you can kind of see, or you can imagine how you know, visualizing like this makes it a little bit easier to parse. Um, I don't know uh, if others have this experience, but after a while, staring at YAML, the, the indentation starts to all kind of bleed together and, you know, especially when it gets to be hundreds of, of lines long, sometimes it's, it's really helpful to just have something a little bit more broken apart. All right. Um, so one thing that is common to both um, 
or, or to a lot of these tools are uh, shape libraries. Uh, shape libraries are often things like icons or, or shapes that you can pull into those tools and then use them. Uh, sometimes they're built in, sometimes they're, they're things that you want to go find externally. Um, Plant UML uh, has a standard library that has a lot of different useful things. Just a couple of examples are their AWS icons. So if you do uh, any sort of, um, if your infrastructure involves any sort of AWS services, uh, that, that can be a, a good resource. Uh, they also have uh, Kubernetes icons in their standard library. That can be good for representing uh, Kubernetes um, art, sort of application architecture. Um, and then if all else fails, a lot of these tools will let you pull in either a PNG file or SVG file. Like you may find um, that your organization has a collection of these files, you know, be they logos or, you know, um, maybe brand uh, has some, some, some things that you can use uh, or other teams may already be using one of these tools and may have already sort of written some of the, the shape libraries. Uh, another tool I want to uh, mention is uh, Mermaid. Uh, don't personally have a lot of experience with Mermaid, uh, but but it is really interesting. It's sprung up uh, and gotten really popular recently because uh, GitHub recently added support for Mermaid diagrams in uh, Markdown that's processed by GitHub. So if you've got any project on GitHub, it's it's pretty trivial to get Mermaid diagrams into their readmes or pull requests, issues, any, any place you use Markdown on GitHub. Uh, some of the, here's a flow chart done in Mermaid. This is just straight off of uh, Mermaid's uh, samples. Again, uh, code, and then underneath you see what that code produces. Uh, Mermaid will also do sequence diagrams. And Mermaid will also do state diagrams. Um, so now I'd like to kind of give some advice about starting to use uh, diagrams more. Um, so I'd say some of the things you want to kind of keep in mind are what, are you, what is your team or organization, or even you know if you're looking at upstream projects, what is it that those uh, um, are using for diagramming already. Sometimes you'll find that your organization already has a tool of choice. Um, if there's not a tool of choice, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to kind of have a positive impact on your organization and say, hey, you know, I went to this talk and there were a bunch of tools and I really like this one. Uh, so I'd like to go, and I'd like to propose that we start doing that. Um, there's also consideration of ecosystem. And by that, I mean, if you're, for example, doing a lot of work in uh, Kubernetes, um, you'll you'll see that they've started to to use Mermaid, uh, for example. So that that's a good reason to to kind of just go with the flow, um, and you get a lot of you know a lot of expertise there. You can lean on other people in the Kubernetes community who've been doing um, who've been doing Mermaid diagrams. There's also uh, existing integrations to consider. So I mentioned GitHub support Mermaid diagrams. Uh, and then GitLab has, supports a service called Crokey.io. Crokey.io actually supports a lot of the, the tools that I've talked about today, um, which means that you can, you know, pick any one of these and use with uh, with GitLab. I think there is a little bit extra setup, um, so so that's worth checking to see if uh, if you know if you're using GitLab internally, check to see if that's turned on and enabled. But um, So um, the other consideration, and, and a big reason I like the tools that uh, use code to produce diagrams, is that if you keep the diagrams with the code, then you get less doc rot. So a couple of, of examples of ways that this, this might play out. Uh, imagine you're replacing uh, in your uh, stack, imagine you're replacing MariaDB with Postgre. Uh, just, just for an example, you might in your code, uh, if it's a small enough change, you might, you know, do something like a, a 
command to replace MariaDB with PostGrey in your documentation. If you've got your diagrams checked in, then that's something that actually gets caught by the by that command. Um, and even if you're, even if it's a little bit more involved, having it in your code base means that you can do things like uh, get grep on your your code base with a keyword, and your diagrams will actually get um, identified with that search. Yeah. yeah, that's a good observation. So um, from the audience, someone pointed out that during a pull request review, if you're changing something that ought to have an updated diagram, then, then that's a good opportunity. You know, that, that makes it so that you can, as part of that pull request, say, actually, uh, the diagrams are now out of date with the change that you've made. Can you please update those in the pull request? And it's not a uh, sort of thing that has to happen on the side. All right. Um, so takeaways. Communication is hard. Software is complex. Systems are complex. Diagrams help. Uh, in real life, diagramming is great. Uh, but probably the biggest risk is that doc rot. Um, so again, I really strongly encourage you to keep your diagrams with your code. And again, I've, I've tried to provide a lot of examples of tools that you can use to, to help you with that. Um, here's some resources I recommend. Um, first one is a book by the um, creator of the C4 model uh, by Simon Brown called Software Architecture for Developers. It's a nice overview of thinking architecturally and uses C4. Um, and then I've got a lot of links here to some of the things that I've, I've shown today. And with that, uh, I'll say thank you and stay cool. Uh, if you have any feedback for me, I'd love to hear it. Uh, so my email is kevin at kahal.net, or you can add me on Twitter and send me a message that way. I don't tweet a lot, but um, definitely a good way to get in contact with me. And I'm on GitHub as K. Howell. All right. So with that, uh, any questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if you had any intentions for any of those tools for that. Okay, so to repeat for stream or recording, uh, the question was about if you start off with a diagram that you're kind of just doing freehand, uh, maybe in a tool like diagrams.net or uh, Excaladraw, um, is there any way of going from that to something that is kept in the code? Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. I suspect you could probably get a good start on that um, in that a lot of the tools will export as SVG. Uh, if you look at an SVG document, those are, you know, machine parsable. So theoretically, you could write a script to extract yeah. at least some of the elements and then have those, you know, not have to retype all of that. <laughs>
that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not aware of, of anything like that, but I, it's honestly not a thing that I've looked into. So. Yeah, I there is um, on the topic of of networking diagrams. There were a couple of interesting ones in Crokey. Um, in Crokey, let me. No, I'll I'll pull it up now real, real quick. Actually, let me just take the slide out of full screen, and then we'll go to Crokey. So, I believe the two that were interesting were, there's uh, packet diagrams. Uh, this is something that's croaky specific, but if you work with um, network data structures a lot, uh, this might be useful. Yeah. This is a packet diag, which is something that the Crokey developers, I, I believe, came up with their stuff. <laughs> Sorry, it scrolls a little faster than I, I thought it would. Yeah, this one's tied to tied to Crokey. So the, the comment was uh, there may be a tool out there that actually takes a network scan and converts, like maybe a Wireshark capture and converts that into one of these diagrams. You can imagine um, if such a tool doesn't exist, it would be pretty easy to implement because the you know this code is is fairly regular. So um, yeah, it's it's pretty trivial to generate this code if you if you find a use that, that warrants that. Um, there might have been another one in here, actually, that was... Yeah, this one is also network-related. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'd say in general, uh, this croaky.io is a really good resource for just seeing a good landscape of what and all is out there. Uh, as, as for, they've got a GitLab integration for croaky.io, so assuming that whoever, if you're running GitLab or um, if you're using a public GitLab, I think this is available. Um, pretty easy to get started with. This one, the way it's architected, you have to run a server somewhere. But you could run that server yourself. It's a open source uh, software. Um, it's also interesting because this web page also hosts a public croaky server. So you can actually um, make requests directly to croaky.io and get the diagrams out that way. Um, I've actually seen, I think it was the mermaid mermaid.live uh, has an option for that. And it's a little difficult in this resolution, but there is an option to generate the croaky URL for that. And you click that, and then you're using that public croaky uh, server to do the rendering. I don't know if there are a lot of other um, easily interfaces to get to that croaky.io um, service. But it's it's not actually all that complicated getting a request to croaky.io that renders a diagram. Because uh, it's, it's essentially just, let's see, they have a good example down here somewhere. So you take the code, and then they have a one-liner here that you 
uh, deflate and then base64 encode it. And then you append that to slash diagram type slash image type, and then you get the result. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the comment was, given how easy it is to um, get this to work, you could write a script and have as part of your build process something that actually goes and reaches out to Croquis.io and get takes the results, you know, uh, saves them to your repository and check that in. Um, another thing that I've seen done related is. C4. Yeah. So, so uh, for the stream or recording, uh, the advice there was if you take and create, for example, maybe a Docker file that runs the Kroki server, um, then then you have, you know, you're sort of immune to Kroki itself going down or or um, being discontinued because you have checked in a way of regenerating those diagrams. Um, another thing I wanted to show was uh, something I've seen used on GitHub is people actually put in their markdown uh, as the link for an image, they'll use a plant UML or croaky URL. And you would think that that might be a little tough, you know, on those services, but, but uh, one thing that's interesting is GitHub will actually take these generated, um, files and it actually sort of caches them. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what they're doing, but you're not you're not putting load on the plant UML or croaky.io servers with these because they're served by GitHub rather than, than those services. Yes. Are there any security implications using real life diagrams? Yes. Um, there was a fun tidbit. Uh, so in preparation for this talk, one of the things I was doing was seeing what existed on Flickr for um, for whiteboards. And I think one dangerous thing with using your cell phone is, let me see if this is the right one. I'll just do a search again. So something to be cautious of is if you have your phone set up to upload your photos somewhere, uh, you know, that means that any pictures of whiteboards that you take are going to get uploaded to the services. And I noticed, you know, just kind of scrolling through the Flickr search, well, <laughs> yeah, there is, yeah, and it's still a little small. Let me bring it down just a little bit, but there are tons and tons of whiteboards just up on Flickr, and <laughs> that made me wonder, you know, how much stuff is on there that really somebody probably doesn't want on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Another security related thing I can uh, mention, I didn't include this because it's a little bit specific to security, but if you're looking at threat modeling, there is a tool from OWASP that, let's see if I can shrink my screen enough to actually, maybe not. <laughs> Anyways, uh, there's a tool called Threat Dragon that does threat models, um, and it's another diagramming tool. Again, that's a little bit more specific to security use case. Um, but that's out there if that's not something that you do. Yeah, and there, it's still kind of early for this software. Um, it feels relatively useful, but I'm not surprised that it doesn't render with this resolution. <laughs> All right. And it, yes. Okay, so, so I'll try to repeat that. Um, so just was the observation, if I go back to context diagrams, was that these can be extremely useful, whoops. <laughs> these can be extremely useful for working with a stakeholder uh, to confirm that the, the sort of big picture systems are all laid out the way that the stakeholder expects or even just once you've implemented something, you know, using it as a tool to talk through with, with a stakeholder how those are laid out, and then sort of contrasting that with um, the sequence diagrams in that the sequence diagrams are very good for communicating sort of shared understanding of, of what the flow is. So um, saying that sequence diagrams tend to be more useful for the developer um, and that the context diagrams being a little bit more useful for communicating with stakeholders. Yes. Doxygen, yes. Yeah, um, I have, yes. And you can find a lot of good examples of that as, as well. So the comment was doxygen, and pardon me for my pronunciation, but um, doxygen is a tool that's been used for years and years uh, to generate documentation. And one of the things it will do is generate um, diagrams of classes and things like that. So I think, let me try SDL maybe. Uh, that but go fails me. Let's try. No, no. Here's an example. Excellent. If you go classes and then maybe not members, is it index maybe that has the diagram? Do you remember off offhand? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I might be. Um, it also might be that the example they have for Python is not good. Let me try another one real quick. Well, of course not. Well, anyways, point was, um, yes, Doxygen is a tool that will do diagrams for your code. Um, and it will do a lot of that sort of code level um, It'll do those code level diagrams where you see the relationships between classes or modules. Um, I also mentioned the IDE. Uh, I, I will say uh, IntelliJ does a pretty good job of that. 
Mirror City of Tools. Any other questions? Yes. So the question was about um, using ASCII art. Um, so it's actually interesting. I'm not going to remember the name of the tool, um, but there is a tool that you can use to generate ASCII art diagrams. Um, that I that thought was right. Yes? ASCII flow. Yeah, that's it. Let me see if I can pull that up real fast. ASCII flow. And yeah, here you can just, let's see, create, um, you know, diagrams that would fit in text files. So I'd, I'd recommend checking that out if, if, you know, the ecosystem that you're participating in uses a lot of plain text. Yeah, that's, that's an, uh, another good tool. Yeah, yeah, and the, the comment there was that the nice thing about using ASCII flow, if you're doing ASCII diagrams, is that it can be imported back into the tool, and then you can edit it in the same interface. Um, and again, resolution is a little bit challenging here, but and now eyesight is a challenge. And then the nice thing, um, this is one that you can use extended so you get the box characters. Or you can say, I don't want any of that. I just want, you know, old school ASCII. And you copy the clipboard, paste in your text file, and you're good to go. One thing I have wondered and I haven't looked into um, with all of these formats, it occurs to me that some of them, there might be some overlap to the degree that you could feasibly import and export from one to the other. I've seen a few um, a few commercial tools that will do that kind of thing. Um, it's a thing that, that would be really neat to see in some of these open source tools more, but I don't think is, is especially prevalent. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all for your attention um, and safe travels. I guess one last thing I'll mention. I will actually uh, upload these slides to uh, to my site, khow.net.